We're going to start talking about the strong opioids and the obviously the strong opioids are the cornerstone for treatment of, uh, of cancer related pain. So, you know, the morphine and morphine like drugs and, and the other uh, strong analgesics. You need to start thinking about these sorts of drugs early if the pain's not being controlled. Now, if you've got someone who's on Tramol or, or Panadine, Panadine Fort, what have you, and they've get, they're getting good, adequate pain control, then that's fine. You're not going to change it just for the sake of changing it because you, sh you, you think they should be on a strong opioid. The important thing is, is to control pain, obviously, and also to try and minimise the toxicity of the, of the drugs, the side effects. It's also important, as I mentioned before, when you're asking someone about any drug, like particularly analgesics, does the drug actually help them? So in terms of, of trying to be clear about whether a, a pain is opioid sensitive or not, I mean, usually you can get a pretty good answer out of the patients when they take a breakthrough dose, whether or not it actually helps them. The important thing there is often the time frame. So we know that time to peak effect of, of most of those oral drugs is somewhere around the vicinity of 30, 40 minutes. So they may be, they're obviously getting some drug before that. You know, if a patient says, well, it takes an hour and a half for the pain to go away, to me that means that their pain relief's you know, that the response that they're getting to the analgesic is not all that great because you'd expect them to get an earlier relief of their pain. If they say they take it and 10 minutes later their pain's better, then that's a bit strange as well because they haven't, haven't actually got the drug on board at that stage. But if they say, yeah, after about, you know, half an hour I start to feel, you know, pain is settling down and it's, it's helped, then that's good. They've actually done research looking at breakthrough pain. And for a lot of pains, by the time that the patient's, you know, using a placebo and, a, and an active drug, by the time they've actually actually get the breakthrough dose and by the time it's effective, in a lot of situations the placebo works just as well because their pain, they've had their pain and their pain's going to settle down. Once again, find the drug that suits the patients. And it's interesting how you get from point A to point B. You know, it can be just like that or it can be up there, down there, try this, combination with this, try that and then finally you get something that gives them some adequate pain relief. And it may be not just a drug, but drugs, so a combination of drugs, particularly if you're thinking about um, neuropathic pain, for example. So what's, what's our choice with the strong opioids? That's the fabulous five that we, I guess, we use. So we've got morphine, which is the, uh, the drug still to which most other drugs are compared. And often when we're rotating drugs, we'll convert it back into daily morphine equivalents and then change it to, the, to another drug. So if we were converting from, say, um, oxycodone into hydromorphone, often we'll convert the oxycodone back to morphine and then convert it to hydromorphone. I mean, there's obviously direct conversions, but when you're dealing with this day, day in, day out, that's the way we normally do it. Methadone's a trickier drug, and we're not going to talk about methadone tonight, but we'll talk about that um, next week, the last week. So morphine, and, and as we all know, morphine's not certainly not used as commonly as it was, you know, say 15 years ago. You know, we've got a lot more choice. Oxycodone is used much more frequently these days. Fentanyl is certainly an option for patients, and fentanyl has its protagonists and people who don't like fentanyl very much. Hydromorphone is a new drug in that it's been revived. Hydromorphone, of course, is an old drug, been around for many, many years, and uh, it sort of disappeared, but it, it's back as a uh, sustained release preparation now, actually, in the last 12 months. There's a new drug we'll talk about next week called Gernista. I've had very little experience with that, but certainly in terms of syringe drivers, we use a lot of hydromorphone in our syringe drivers, probably a lot more morphine than morphine these days, in actual fact. And then you've got methadone, and we'll, we'll talk about methadone next week as well. Methadone is a, is a difficult drug to use, and I must say, I mean, I use a, a reasonable amount of it, but I'm still very, I have a very healthy respect for using methadone. Three are commonly used to make up the vast majority of strong opioids that we use in inpatient and the domiciliary setting. So hydromorphone has, uh, has been released in the control release formulation, just so that you're aware that it's around. It is available on the PBS, and no doubt its use will become more widespread. I've used it once since last year, and it didn't work. That patient is actually on a syringe driver on hydromorphone. 
he's on a syringe drive with hydromorphone. This fellow's actually a nurse who's um, got metastatic lung cancer and he's still working full time with his syringe driver on. He's actually a nurse unit manager and uh, I actually bumped into, I caught up with him yesterday. But yeah, there you go. So as a, in a syringe driver, he's had very good pain relief and he's just starting to run into problems now, but we've been looking after him for about three or four months now. So, and the other, the other thing on that slide was about methadone. So as I've already alluded to, methadone is a very useful drug and it's, it's interesting that when you listen to people who've been around in Europe for a while, when they're having sort of discussions in the, in the 1980s about, you know, making a plan for how to use opioids for palliative medicine, morphine won by, but just by a nose. As that, that was going to be, you know, the primary opioid. Methadone, which is very popular, particularly in um, Italy. They still use a lot of, uh, and a lot of research comes out of Italy. Stefano Mercadente puts out a lot of stuff on, on methadone. So things could have been quite different if, uh, if the Europeans had gone with methadone. There are some people around who have a lot of experience. Rob um, Jaffrey, who was the, who was retired from um, Prince Charles, he worked in New Zealand and when he was over there they had a limited choice for the opioids so he he's, he's has a lot of experience. Lucy Rodriguez who used to work with me once again came from a pain, you know, she was she was an anaesthetist with a pain fellowship as well as her palliative care fellowship and uh, she'd had a lot of experience with, with methadone as well. So I've probably learned a, a bit from her over the last three years that she, she worked for me. So we're going to we're going to look mainly at as I said at, at morphine tonight because it, even though we don't use morphine as much as we used to you know 10 or 15 years ago because of the choice that we actually have now it, it's still the sort of parent drug if if you like and the things that happen with morphine often happen with the other newer drugs as well so it's a strong analgesic used for severe no susceptive pain and not not just cancer pain as we all know it's mediated by specific opioid receptors in the CNS and that's the mu or morphine opioid receptor it's readily absorbed by all routes and that's a good thing about morphine so we can give it IV IM subcut orally there's one route that we can't give it that because I was having a look through a number of those papers and it mentioned transdermal morphine you can't give morphine transdermally you know, so a number, a number of you who did that pretest, because I, I had a look at all the pretests the, the last week. But you can give it rectally. You can even give it directly into the brain. So intracerebroventricular morphine, and of course you can give it intrathecally, spinally as well. So you can give it just about any way you like. What about its potency? And and this this is still an ongoing issue. It depends what what text you actually read. But normally when I when I convert from oral and say we've got someone in on oral morphine and we want to put them on a syringe driver my normal conversion is a half but some people convert it by a third now when does that start to make differences well obviously if you're in a dose that's you know under 50 milligrams or under 100 milligrams there's not too much difference but if you're looking at a dose that's 300 or 400 milligrams it can be quite a big difference so then I think the rule, my rule of thumb then is be cautious because you can always give them breakthroughs if their pain's still an issue but if you make them comatose and aspirate and bump them off because you've done that, give them pinpoint pupils and then have the resident ringing you at three in the morning saying you know, this patient's comatose and has stopped breathing and has got pinpoint pupils, well then it's difficult to manage then isn't it? You know if you've got someone who's end of life what do you actually do? Do you accept that you've sort of bumped them off? And part of nature's, you know, it's a natural product. I don't think so. So my only advice there is if you if if you've got a patient who's maybe at home and is in oral on orals and is on a reasonably big dose, you might be a bit more conservative. And the other, that, that, but that's not the only thing. You've got, you've got to look at other things with morphine as well, which we'll we'll talk about. Oral to IV is said to be a third. So if you look at uh, Robert Twycross's book, and I have a lot of respect for Robert Twycross. Then, then that's what he what he advises. The half life is is a couple of hours when it's oral. It's a bit shorter when it's given parenterally. The main site of metabolism metabolism of the drug is in the liver, 
So you get these metabolites of morphine 3 and morphine 6 glucuronides. And the problem is that you run into problems not so much with liver impairment, but certainly you can run into significant problems with renal impairment. But if someone's got both liver and renal impairment together, then that, that's possibly a recipe for trouble. So with a single dose, it's somewhere, it's a few hours.